Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from CNM in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is video G of On the Heart. Uh, we're focus focusing here on the physiology of the heart, more specifically the pacemaker cells or the autorhythmic cells of the heart. So remember that cardiac muscle tissue is made up of all these muscle cells, of course, and the majority of those cells are your typical contracting muscle cells. We discussed those in the previous video, but we have a small amount, about 1%, that are muscle cells that have become adapted to generating greater potentials that can turn into action potentials. So they have lost their ability to contract. They're essentially an innate little nervous system for the heart. And we refer to all of these cells that make up about 1% and, and called autorhythmic cells or pacemaker cells, but we call them collectively the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. The intrinsic conduction system of the heart. So they're still muscle cells, but they've lost their ability to contract and they act more like nervous cells. They're not nervous cells, they're still muscle cells, but they act like nervous cells. So what's really interesting about them is that they never maintain a very stable resting membrane potential. So they're very restless cells that constantly depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize. And they do that by first generating graded potentials, and it's those graded potentials that we call pacemaker potentials. And these pacemaker potentials, when they reach threshold voltage, they fire um, an action potential. And it's that action potential which will then trigger the contractile cells to fire their action potential with the opening of voltage-gated ion channels. Now, these pacemaker cells are very nicely arranged in the heart. Uh, they're distributed throughout the heart, as we'll see here momentarily in pictures. And because of their nice anatomical arrangement, we're going to see that the conduction of the action potentials throughout the heart occurs very neatly, in a sense. You'll see that. Um, at the same time, the organization of these pacemaker cells allows for the atria and the ventricles to actually contract um, slightly separately. Um, in, in previous videos, I might have said that the whole heart acts as a, as a syncytium, but we see that first, now that we've come further along in our understanding of the heart, uh, we'll go, we're going to see that it's first the atria that will contract, and very quickly after that, the ventricles will contract. So we can talk about atrial and ventricular syncytia. So now we're ready to take a look at the anatomy of this intrinsic conduction system. Remember, intrinsic conduction system refers to all of these pacemaker cells that are present in only very specific regions of the heart. The very first region we refer to, that I'll point out, is called the sinoatrial node, and it sits in the um, right atrium nearby the entrance of the superior vena cava. We often abbreviate it as the SA node. It's a little cluster of those pacemaker cells. We see another cluster of those pacemaker cells closer to the, to the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve, and we refer to it as the atrioventricular node or the AV node. Now there are some pacemaker cells that interconnect these nodes, as you can see here. We also have some fibers that reach out to the left atrium, meaning that if depolarization starts in the SA node, which it typically does, that depolarization with the help of these various pacemaker cells that create these various bundles that I'm not going to hold you responsible for, um, will reach this atrium, and we can see that the depolarization can reach it, reach the AV node from the SA node via these various regions here of um, pacemaker cells. So, so far, a term I need for you to know is the SA node, the AV node. Then we get to that um, 
that region in the heart where we need to make it from the atria into the ventricles. And so now we have a bundle I do need for you to know, and that is the bundle of his or the atrioventricular bundle. So literally, this is a bundle of pacemaker cells that allow for our depolarization to make it from the right atrium to the um, wall of the the uh, ventricles, that is that interventricular septum area. Once we have reached that interventricular septum, septum we're going to see that the bundle of his um, will split into two sides, and one side we'll refer to as uh, the right and the other side is the left bundle branches. So here we have our right and left bundle branches. And if I'm going to follow just the left bundle branch, it'll eventually dip all the way into the apex and then move upward along the, the exterior wall of each ventricle if I'm now pointing to the other bundle branch. All of these bundle branches give rise to much smaller branches and we'll refer to those as the Purkinje fibers. So if we now trace the traveling of the depolarization that occurs with the help of our um, pacemaker cells, it starts in a healthy individual, the depolarization will start in the SA node, it'll travel to the AV node, from the AV node, will travel via the bundle of his to the left and the right bundle branches, which then give rise to the Purkinje fibers. And it's not until the depolarization reaches the Purkinje fibers that the ventricles will contract, by the way. So we're going to first see that the atria will contract and then eventually the ventricles. You might wonder why the depolarization doesn't spread throughout the heart and stays within this, what we call the intrinsic conduction system, very carefully following the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers, and etc. And that, a lot, that has to do with the fiber skeleton. You might recall in the first video on the heart that I explained to you that there is quite a bit of connective tissue fibers, or there are quite a bit of connective tissue fibers in the heart, that provides a level of insulation, and this is also what ensures that our um, depolarization travels in the direction that it should travel in this intrinsic conduction system. Finally, the last thing to point out is that after depolarization starts in the SA node and spreads throughout both atria, Eventually, all of the depolarization must remerge into this single node. It's kind of a traffic jam there, so we're going to see a little bit of a delay um, occurring here before our depolarization can be passed on into the ventricles. A final point to make with the help of this diagram is that the Purkinje fibers play an important role in being depolarized last because they're going to make sure that, and you can see some of them here, these Purkinje fibers, they make sure that these papillary muscles depolarize first. Remember those nipple-like muscles that are attached to the strings of our valves, to those chordae tendinae, to which the cusps of our atrioventricular valves are attached. And by first contracting these papillary muscles, we're going to tighten the strings and we're going to make sure that the cusps are going not going to flap uh, into the atria as the, the ventricles begin to contract. So as contraction starts to build or as pressure starts to build up eventually in these ventricles, we want to make sure that the valves are ready for that. And these um, Purkinje fibers that stimulate these papillary muscles to contract first and foremost before any of the rest of the ventricular muscles contract um, ensures that the blood is not going to flow backwards into the, the atria. 
So here then we see a nice summarizing illustration of how the uh, depolarization in the, in the intrinsic conduction system travels. We're going to typically start in the SA node. From the SA node, the depolarization will travel to the AV node, um, or I should say to the two atria and eventually collect in the AV node. From the AV node, we're going to then go down into the um, bundle of his, and the bundle of his will split into the bundle branches, which give rise to the Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers are going to contract the papillary muscles and eventually the rest of the ventricles can contract and that ultimately leads to the ejection of the blood. Now notice what it says here too. The only direct connection, electrical connection, between the atria and the ventricles is the bundle of his. There's so much connective tissue in that whole area and that, that makes it difficult for the electrical current or depolarization to make it from the atria to the ventricles except where we have that bundle of his. In the previous video, we really studied the action potential of contractile cells, but what we need to now do is focus on these autorhythmic cells. After all, it is their action potential that allows the contractile cells to generate their own action potential, which then leads to contraction of the muscle cells. Let's first take a look at this little um, graph here. And right off the bat, you can see that we have the three ions, the three typical ions again, that play an important role in our heart. What is different though this time is that you can see that it is calcium ions that have a much more abundant influx and a much more rapid influx and not so much sodium. Sodium still does play a role in flowing into the cell, but it doesn't seem to have as much of an impact. So let's now relate this to the, the graph, the bigger graph up here. First of, all, first of all, right off the bat, you can tell that the resting membrane potential of autorhythmic cells is much higher than your contractile cells. The contractile cells have a resting membrane potential of closer to minus 90. So we sit a bit up high, or a bit higher, I should say, when it comes to these pacemaker cells. And as I said, these pacemaker cells are very ANSI cells. They depolarize, they repolarize, they depolarize, they repolarize, and create what we call a sinus wave. You might hear that terminology being used at times. Okay. Well, as always, in order for cells to fire an action potential, whether they are any kind of muscle cell, or nerve cells, we need to reach threshold voltage. And the threshold voltage is shown right here. So right here at minus 40, this is approximately the threshold voltage for our uh, pacemaker cells. Now, just like any excitatory cell, whether we're talking about a muscle cell or a nerve cell, graded potentials must generate first they then reach threshold voltage and that leads then to the opening of voltage-gated ion channels and therefore the firing of an action potential. So on our figure, we see here our graded potentials. They reach threshold voltage and that opens up our uh, voltage-gated ion channels. In this case, they are going to be calcium voltage-gated ion channels in the red. So allow me to label some things here. So, it, and I'll, I'll use the, the same colors as your book does. So in the orange here, this is where we see the, the slow influx of sodium ions, ions, and this is where we have our graded potential occurring, which we can call pacemaker potentials, or your book calls them pre-potentials, all the same thing pacemaker potential or pre-potential. Remember, graded, but there are different kinds of graded potential. In AMP1, you learned about uh, excitatory 
and um, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials in the nervous system, in the skeletal muscle system you learned about, the motor end plate potentials. Those are all graded potentials. Um, here you see an additional kind of a graded potential we call the pacemaker potential or even pre-potential. Once these pacemaker potentials reach threshold, they can open up calcium voltage gated ion channels and it's the influx of the calcium that creates the rapid depolarization. And so all of this right here from this point forward to about here is our action potential. And this is our depolarization occurring here. Well, this is our repolarization occurring there. Repolarization due to the outflux of potassium, depolarization this time due to the influx of not sodium, but calcium. And once again, it is this action potential that results from all of these pacemaker potentials that then allows for action potentials to fire in the contractile cells, which in turn results in contraction of muscle cells. So this wraps up our discussion of the intrinsic conduction system, which is made up of pacemaker cells or autorhythmic cells.